Hello, everyone, and welcome to this quasi cyber seminar series, Research and Observatory Catchments, The Legacy and the Future. Quasi is very excited to host this series, which was convened by Jamie Shanley from USGS, Stephen Sebastian at USDA Forest Service, Julia Jones at Oregon State, and Teresa Blume at GFC Potsdam. Um, my name is Julia Masterman. I am the Science Education and Outreach Coordinator for Quasi. Quasi is the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science Incorporated. Um, and our mission is to advance water science by strengthening interdisciplinary collaboration, providing critical infrastructure through our data services, and promoting education in water science at all levels through programs like this one. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to me, visit our website, uh, or sign up for our newsletter to learn more about what we do or to get involved. Um, I'll post a link in the chat in a moment with uh, a link to sign up for our newsletter. This webinar series is being recorded and will be posted on the Quasi YouTube channel later this evening. Um, to check out previous week's recordings for the first and second webinars in this series, visit youtube.com forward slash quasi. We've had great participation in this series so far. Thank you all for joining us this week and for previous weeks as well. We had 234 attendees last week and we're hoping for at least as many this week um, and for the rest of the series. So thank you all for your interest and for continuing to tune in. Um, we have a lineup of incredible speakers this week as well. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put them in the chat. There'll be time for a brief Q&A after each presentation and then a longer discussion at the end. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, we look forward to hearing from your thoughts. To, we look forward to hearing from all of you. And uh, this week's topic is Alpine Boreal and Arctic Catchments. And without further ado, I'll pass the mic to this week's convener, Jamie Shanley, to introduce this week's topic and first speaker. <clears throat> Thanks, Julia. So yes, this week we'll be talking about alpine boreal and arctic catchments and Jim McNamara is slipping in there sort of in the middle of those things. Um, here's our map of today's, so today, yeah, here we go. Today's catchments that are being discussed are in red. There are nine speakers or more than nine catchments here because some people will be talking about multiple sites. But I love this map because we are really spanning the globe today from Svalbard to Antarctica. Um, next slide. And, uh, oh, well, you still see the map. The yellow dots are past week's presentation. So this map will keep getting more yellow and the, the red dots will always be the current week. So we're going, uh, if Steve wants to say a few words about how the questions are gonna work. Yeah, thank you and welcome everyone. So enter your, your questions or your comments through the chat window. The panelists will see them. The attendees will not be able to see them. So we're asking all panelists to, if they respond to a question in writing, to uh, include the question and their answer to it at the, at the same time. But please keep things rolling in throughout the entire discussion. We will uh, work through in the background and try and organize it all and have it ready for when the uh, uh, question, when, when we have time to discuss things. There might be a couple minutes after each pre presentation, so feel free to put individual directed questions in, or feel free to direct it to all panelists for a broader discussion at the end or perhaps throughout. Um, thank you. Yep, and these, so these are short presentations. Um, the purpose is to introduce the catchment, to talk about ways to collaborate. Um, at the end of the series, in the last week, we're gonna just be having a session where we're gonna be talking about collaboration and synthesis products that can come out of this effort. So let's launch right in. Our first talk will be by Anna Bergstrom and she'll be going to, taking us to Antarctica. Go ahead, Anna. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm representing the McMurdo LTER. And so while I'm primarily gonna talk about hydrology, I just wanna point out that we are a long-term ecological research site. So we have a ton of other data and all of that is publicly available at the URL, URL you can see there. Next, please. Um, so the McMurdo Dry Valleys are the largest ice-free area on the Antarctic continent, and they're formed by the Transantarctic Mountains blocking the flow of the East Antarctic ice sheet to the coast. 
So we're at about uh, 77 degrees south, and um, we're mostly based out of the Taylor Valley, which is the valley just above that McMurdo Dry Valley's label you can see there. Next, please. So to give you an idea of the system we're working with, um, alpine glaciers form the headwaters of almost all of our streams. Um, the glaciers themselves have a stream network of superglacial streams. Um, we don't have any subglacial drainage like you typically picture for more temperate glaciers. And those glaciers feed um, proglacial streams which run along the valley floor and flow into uh, permanently ice covered, um, mostly closed basin lakes. So a few stats, we have mass balance on five glaciers, um, 17 stream gauges, met records at 14 different stations, and we measure lake levels at seven different closed basin lakes. Next, please. So um, these headwater glaciers are the dominant source of water for the entire ecosystem. And in the summer, we get 24 hours of sunlight and our average air temperatures are right around zero degrees Celsius. So that means that the energy balance is really delicate here and a slight increase in radiation or decrease in glacier albedo can result in a large increase in meltwater generation. So we can see from comparing summer mass loss to runoff that we have a really close coupling between melt and stream flow, but it's not exactly one to one. So the variable properties of the glacier contributing area, things like elevation, surface roughness, um, and albedo are driving some of the differences in runoff across our streams. And this also means that as we see more warming, um, we should uh, expect some of our watersheds might be more vulnerable to melt than others and also impacts from that melt. Next, please. So um, early on, we were looking at our MET records, particularly the Lake Hoare MET station, which is that red star in the map. And we um, picked up a cooling trend despite decreasing wind speeds and increasing solar flux. And the year that was published, um, we had what was called the flood year, which is outlined in that dashed circle, which was actually a two week warm period of just unprecedented melt and stream flow. Um, next, please. So um, we can further contextualize our um, LTER records with the um, long-term record of stream flow in the Onyx River, which is the longest uh, river on the continent, and it's in the Wright Valley, which is one valley north of the Taylor Valley. And um, this record was started in 1969 by the New Zealand Antarctic Program. And what we can see when we place it in this context is that we've had previous periods of um, cool and we've had previous warmer periods and even some flood years. So um, that picture is showing uh, the flow in the 1986-87 season. And we can see just how much water is moving down the valley. And that's um, shown by that black arrow in that bar plot too. So while we've had some cool years and some warm years, um, overall we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, meltwater coming down the valley. And if we look at the Lake Vanda um, lake level change, which uh, is uh, gets water from the Onyx River, we can see um, that record reflected. And overall in the last 50 years, we've had 14 meters of lake level rise in Lake Vanda. Next, please. You have about two and a half minutes left. Okay. Um, so when we um, go to our stream gauges, we can do the traditional topographic based um, delineation of our contributing areas, but um, our, our contributing areas aren't uh, true contributing areas like you'd expect in other watersheds. And really it's the low elevation ablation zones of our glaciers that are generating that meltwater. Um, so because we're a polar desert, we get um, less than 10 centimeters of snow water equivalent each year. And any snow that falls anywhere off the glacier generally sublimates. So that means our hill slopes are largely disconnected from our streams. And we also have permafrost underlaying our streams. So we typically, or we don't get any um, deep groundwater contributions to our streams either. So really what it is, is when the sun circles around and hits our glaciers, they create this um, daily melt pulse. So um, any sort of uh, uh, hydrologic or biogeochemical dynamics are a result of what's happening on the glaciers themselves or that melt pulse coming down and interacting um, with the hyperreic zone as the channel expands and contracts. Next, please. So when we take samples at the outlets of our streams, um, what we're finding actually is we get chemostasis, chemostasis of our major weathering products. And that is despite the fact that we're lacking some of these traditional hydrologic flow paths that you look to in other watersheds to explain some of your chemostasis. 
Next, please. So while we are a bit of an end member ecosystem and have some unique things going on, uh, we have a wealth of data and a lot of interesting questions to ask here and we are always uh, open for collaborations. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. We don't have any questions or discussion points at this time. So unless something rolls in here in, here in a, the next minute, I guess that we should probably just advance to the next speaker, Jamie. Just have, I have a real quick one for Anna. So with no groundwater contribution to flow, is there any flow at all in the winter? Or does no, it really there's no flow at all. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we get some periods during the middle of the summer at which it goes dry too. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like I said, it's the energy balance is really driving it. So if we have just like, you know, a day or a couple days of cloudy periods, um, everything shuts down. Good. Okay. Thank you. So we'll yeah. move right now to Tomasz Wagzinek. I didn't do it right. He said that's not Tomasz Wagzinek. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. He's taking us to the other part, other extreme, the very far north in Svalbard. I'm right. just going to... I'm just going to show you a brief overview of the climate change uh, impacts on flow regime in catchments with different level of glaciation in southwestern Spitsbergen. Uh, I work at the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences, and my institute manages Polish polar station Hornsund, located in Svalbard in southern part of Svalbard in Spitsbergen. Next, please. Uh, the Arctic region is highly impacted by the ongoing climate change uh, and the recognition of hydrological processes is listed as one of the most important research needs by IPCC. So the goals of my studies are the identification of climate change impact on hydrological processes and also thermal regime in Arctic catchments located in South Spitsbergen. Uh, and that's for updating uh, water balance studies uh, based on both measurements and simulations of the past and future conditions. Next, please. Uh, just to show you how the station looks like during summer, uh, it was established in 1957 and since 1978, we have uh, year round scientific research uh, that has been conducted uh, in different fields. And I coordinate the meteorological and also hydrological monitoring conducted at the station. Next, please. Uh, having meteorological station there that works as part of WMO uh, gives us information on the climate change in Atl Atlantic sector of the Arctic and all the data that we collect there uh, gives us information about how the climate changes in this part of the world. Next please. Uh, as we have data from the 8th of the 70s, uh, if we look through uh, the data on uh, annual average temperatures, we see that the temperature uh, increased 4.5 centigrade in the last 40 years. And that's more than six times higher than the global average. In case of uh, amount of precipitation, it's also higher by uh, 250 millimeters. Uh, so from, it changed from the 80s uh, when it, uh, the, the amount of precipitation was around 400 millimeters. Recently, we observe it's around 600 millimeters. Next, please. You have a little over three minutes left. Cool. Uh, what we also observe is changes in seasonality, prolongation of season with positive temperatures, and also large uh, increases in autumn precipitation. So there is just slight change in uh, air temperature during summer, but autumn and winter, the uh, air temperatures are much higher. Go next, please. Uh, Another thing is the snow cover, uh, cover duration. The, uh, the time of the period of snow cover duration is shorter than it used to be in the 80s. Uh, recently, it's less, uh, around 40 days less uh, than it's, uh, it used to be. Next, please. Uh, the higher air, air temperature and also higher liquid precipitation lead to, to permafrost degradation. In the 80s, uh, the thickness of the active layer was around three meters. Recently, it's around six meters. So the infiltration goes deeper as uh, frozen ground is impermeable for water, but once it thaws, it is permeable. So the inf infiltration goes deeper and groundwater can reach deeper layers. Next, please. 
this degradation leads to increased infiltration and contribution of groundwater to river discharge. That's also something that we observe in this area as we have piezometers in the field. Next, please. Uh, just last month, we published a report on changes in hydrology. Uh, maybe you're not familiar, but there is the report called the State of Environmental Science in Svalbard. So at different locations, the, the trends are similar. So different stations in Svalbard have similar trends in air temperature and also precipitation. Next, please. Uh, I'm involved in the project that, uh, of which the topic is identification of rainfall runoff processes in catchments with different level of glacial coverage. Next, please. Uh, it was published, uh, one of our catchments I described in hydrological processes in the special issue with some of you guys. Next, please. You can find the data on the runoff and others. Uh, and recently we tried to run 50 different models and some of them work really well at different catchments. Next, please. Uh, just to uh, check how the models uh, work uh, during the period when there is no uh, uh, run of measurements, we have time-lapse cameras. So if there is high precipitation or high runoff uh, that comes from modeling, not from the run of measurements, uh, we get the information from those cameras. Next, please. As you can see here is the changes in the hydrological regime of high Arctic rivers. Uh, the regime changed, the, the period of the activity of streams was shorter, recently it's longer and longer. Next, please. Uh, and it's expected that the projections show that there will be less snow cover and there will be higher temperatures and also higher precipitation in the end till the end of this century. Next, please. Uh, this, this means that uh, the hydrological regime will change. Recently, the activity of the uh, rivers is between June and uh, September. In the future, the streams may be active throughout the year. And also the uh, permafrost, uh, the active layer will be thicker. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tomasz. We did get one comment. I believe it's about a, a glacier that is called Hans Breen, um, and yeah. it, it was uh, completed into the ocean at that time, and but now it, it apparently is on land. Do you can you comment quickly on? No, you know, it still tree? terminates in, in in the ocean. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we will move to Lisa. And I won't even try her last name. <laughs> I'll let her <laughs> say it herself. And uh, she'll be moving us to Finland, a little further south. Go ahead, Lisa. OK, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, my name is Lisa Ogon Manaho. <laughs> so it's not so easy to pronounce, but anyway. And I work as a researcher, senior researcher in Natural Resources Institute, Finland. And, uh, and I'm very happy that I have this possibility to introduce some of our long-term monitoring sites in Finland for you today. So next slide, please. And before I start to present our, our, our sites, I would like to first tell something about this ICP integrated monitoring, because our sites uh, belongs to that network. And uh, this integrated, um, this ICP IM, they are part of the effect oriented activities under the conventional long range transboundary air pollution. And the aim is to monitor the effects of transboundary air pollution on natural ecosystems. And this integrated monitoring, it means simple that uh, we are doing this monitoring at the same time and we are using similar measurements and using the harmonized methods as well. And in the map, you can see that there are about 50 ICBIM sites in, in Europe. So next slide, please. And uh, there are some criteria how to, how to, how to set up this, uh, or where to set up these, uh, these plots. And they should be, uh, for example, representative of the biogeographical province in which it lies. In Finland, it means in the Northern Boreal vegetation zone. And they should be uh, forested and also as natural condition as possible. And this monitoring is divided into number of subprograms like a meteorology deposition, soil water, and so on. And on the left, you can see a figure about these different subprograms. Next, please. And uh, 
in Finland, we actually have uh, five these integrated monitoring sites. The northeast one is the Pallas, and then we have here Tervi and Valkeakotinen. Those are the active sites. We have we have still two inactive sites, but those I'm not going to present to you today. Next, please. And there are some more information about these sites. And on the right side, there is a map, one of the catchment. This Valkeakotinen, which is our uh, southeast plot. And the middle of that, it's a lake. And above, there is a figure about this uh, this catchment. And you can see the lake there. And in the upper corner, right upper right corner, there is an open area where we uh, measure the deposits. And the lake is surrounded the forest. And under, you can see the picture, a photo from the forest. This is an old growth forest. And the uh, Nova spruce is a dominated, dominated tree species there. You can see also some devices in the forest. Uh, this green funnel is uh, for little folk collection and those orange funnels, if you can see there, they are for true folk. And uh, Finland, it's, uh, it's a long country, 1,000 kilometers. It means that there is a change in precipitation and temperature as well, and also in deposition. And usually in the, the deposition is increasing to part the notch, and it's following the air pollution trends. And in these sites, uh, in addition of this integrated monitoring, there is also some other project going on, like this ICOS. Probably many of you are familiar with that, but also the others. And uh, this data is used for uh, monitoring, modeling. Um, they are also the comparison site for the different experiments and so on. So next slide, please. You have uh, two minutes. OK, next slide. And here are some results. This is a deposition result, sulfate and inorganic nitrogen. And there are decreasing trend, all of those uh, deposition. And you can see that there is a difference between site, but also in time. Next, please. And this is a concentration, sulfate concentration, but inside of catchment. And you can see that there is also the decreasing trend. And there are these different subprograms. Next slide. Um, there is lake chemistry, something, this DOC, TOC concentration in lake. You can see that there is an increasing trend, which is also seen in many other places as well. Next, please. And there is some results from the vegetation. And this uh, past 20 years, and these uh, measurements have been carried out every five years. And you can see that there is also some kind of trends. and the, they are mainly uh, related to the uh, change in uh, temperature and precipitation. And uh, well, on the on the left side there are vascular plants, and on the on the right side there are results from the mosses. So the next, please. And I would like to conclude that this message which we have taken, uh, which have been taken, they have reduced the emission. And they have been effective, and uh, and these results from our our long term monitors, monitoring sites prove them to be true. Mm -hmm. And there are some more detailed results, but I thought that I won't have any time to show, to tell you about those. Mm -hmm. So next slide, please. So I just want to thank you for listening to me, and uh, there's more information in this website, in the Suke pages, and. You can contact to me or you see what as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I think we have a minute for questions if anybody wants to post one or if any of our panelists want to um, address Lisa. All right, Jamie. Okay, we'll move right to Kevin Bishop. We'll be going one country over to Sweden and talk about some more integrated monitoring sites. Let's go. Great. Right. Thank you for the chance to talk here about the Swedish integrated monitoring sites. And one of the beauties of the European IM program is there's such uniformity in what we do. And be Sweden being close to Sweden, even many of the results are quite simple. So since Lisa did the hard work of presenting the sites, this allows me to look a little bit at the origins of this integrated monitoring, some of the strengths we have right now and where it is going in the future. Next slide, please. 
Sweden, um, we've had 55 years of surface water monitoring in Sweden. When we hit 50, we had a party, the king came, it was wonderful. <laughs> this monitoring, no monitoring comes out of nowhere. There's always a driving force. And it started 55 years ago with eutrophication, the problem of untreated or poorly treated sewage in large rivers and large lakes. So that's where we started. Next slide, please. Uh, but uh, one of the beauties of a monitoring program is that it should be useful for other things. And so very quickly by the late 60s, Sweden and the Nordic countries discovered acid rain. And so this monitoring program was pivoted to use to provide information on acidification. And Sweden hosted the first UN conference on the environment in 1972. And Sweden wanted to tell the world about this new acid rain problem. So we used this wonderful monitoring data, whole five whole years of it to show how a river was acidifying. Next slide, please. Well, as we know, when you create a monitoring program for something and you want to use it for something else, there's a great risk that it's not going to be a pretty sight. And in fact, it was pretty ugly because we look at that river now and there was no acidification going on in that river. It's pretty embarrassing to think what Sweden presented as the evidence of acidification. But this is also the starting point for realizing it's not the big rivers and lakes where the problem is, it's the small catchments, the acid sensitive ones we need to look at. And we need to understand the connection of a catchment to the water to understand how acid rain is working. Next. And that is where catchment monitoring began. In the 1980s, there was going to be a permanent system of catchment monitoring to look at both acid rain and forestry. Uh, that great ambition of permanence didn't last for more than half a decade. But by the 1990s, we'd at least gotten to, we were down to four catchments focused on air, air pollution. But at least those are still going since the 1990s. Um, now, since the combating acid rain has been so successful, the future of these acid rain monitoring catchments was somewhat in doubt. But fortunately, it's been saved by the EU. Next slide, please. You have, all this, you have two and a half minutes, Kevin. Yeah, all this integrated monitoring, the ICP, much of what Lisa talked about has all been voluntary but the EU has created something called a ceiling directive, which requires monitoring of air pollution effects on ecosystems. So this is a lifeline to the integrated monitoring programs, at least. Next slide, please. Now, what are the strengths of these, pro, these IAM sites? Well, one thing is you've got a similar network all over Europe. So if you want to say something about how air pollution is affecting an ecosystem, in this case, about what happens when you decrease nitrogen, you can get great data from all across Europe. This is what the IM program is for. Next slide. But it, in the spirit of open science, these open data sources are there for opportunistic people like myself. I do much of my work on another site, which I desperately wanted to be made an IM site 25 years ago. It didn't become an IM site. It's now the Crickland flagship. You'll hear about it next week. But when I've been working on Crickland on the riparian zone and how temperature controls the DOC coming out, and I want to see, does this work somewhere else? I've got these four other IM sites that speak the same language of all universities that I can go to. And that's been a great source of opportunistic research by myself and others. Next slide, please. And my final slide is about what the future will be. And it is upgrading this integrated monitoring and putting it into a part of a long-term ecological research system of 26 countries, 450 sites, 35 of them even socioeconomic platforms. And I know that the US started LTERs, but Europe, we're gonna come on strong. We wanna have this as a European research infrastructure, which puts it on a completely different level for the, what we hope, generations ahead. Thank you very much. Next slide, and I'm done. Thank you. That was thank me you, earlier. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I think we have a, a brief amount of time for questions. If anybody wants to pose one quick, or if any of the panelists or moderators have a have a question. 
I, I have a question, Kevin. This is Jill Barron, and this may not be nearly enough time to ask it, but I'm curious about the changes you've seen in inorganic carbon over all these years, and what are the driving forces for what I know are some big dynamics. We have papers on what's happened to inorganic carbon. And the answer is not much. DOC has been changing, but not the inorganic carbon. And the other news I'd want to have is that brownification, that is so 20, 2000s. I mean, we've got a decade of not much brownification in most. I mean, it's stabilized in Sweden, except for a few regions. So uh, very interesting, but no big connection between the inorganic carbon and the DOC. If you look at the carbon isotopes, there's some other interesting things there. Be happy to talk <laughs> to you about it. Just any few papers. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kevin. And we'll move right to Jim McNamara, who will bring us to the US, to, to Idaho. Great. This is a photo of the Dry Creek Experimental Watershed adjacent to Boise up in the foothills. What I want you to see from this picture is that it's characterized by steep slopes, a healthy riparian zone, sages and shrubs in the lowlands, and forests in the uplands. Next. Um, Boise is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, or Idaho is, next to uh, Washington, Oregon. Boise is in Southwest Idaho, along the edges of the Snake River Plain, and Dry Creek is up in the hills next to the plain. The photo um, on the right uh, that we saw was looking from our office building through the football field up to the hills to the watershed in the right. So we have excellent line of sight telemetry for our data systems. The site is primarily funded by individual PI grants, uh, but Boise State does provide funding for a permanent support scientist to, to keep it all going. Next. Our mission is to improve the understanding and prediction of interaction between the water, rock, plants, and animals in the past, present, and future, and to provide temporarily continuous and spatially distributed data to whoever wants it. Next. So we've been working for about 20 years. The watershed drains about 28 kilometers squared. We have five meteorological stations, an eddy covariance station, seven stream flow stations, a bunch of soil moisture monitoring stations, some intermittent geochemistry data, lots of LIDAR data for snow on and snow off, um, and uh, snow surveys available. Uh, all on near real-time telemetry. Our data sources are three. We have our own website that serves up essentially flat files. We publish our data on ScholarWorks through DSU with DOIs there. And we're part of the Quasi Weighted Water Data Center, but I think we're pretty far behind on up uploading our data. Best thing is to in, uh, email our tech, Pam Ashlin, to get data. Next. These are just some screenshots from our data pages. If you go to our data site, you'll see the list of sites on the right. You can click on them. And what you get is in the lower right where um, we see, you can see real time uh, data for every day, week, month, year, that's uncorrected. Then there's a tab for historical data uh, to download. Next. Uh, the, hydrologically, the site is driven by um, a gradient in uh, elevation gradient where our total annual precipitation approximately doubles across the 1,000 meter relief from 400 to about 800 millimeters a year, and also a change in phase where the upper elevations are dominated by snow, the lower elevations are dominated by rain. Next. You, have about, you have about three minutes. Okay. Um, so, and the hydrograph generally looks like this, where there's a very clear division between what we call the draining season with intermittent water inputs and snow melt to the drying season where not much happens in a recovery season. Next. Uh, rather than post our driving science questions, I'll just say that those change as uh, essentially NSF and you all say what we should be working on. Instead, of, uh, you can find all of our publications on our website and our theses and dissertations. Next. I will look back though on uh, some of the themes that we have worked on include uh, a lot of work on the catchment water balance with a specific emphasis on understanding losses to bedrock. You'll see that high elevation sites generally lose water to low elevation sites through the subsurface system. Next. We spend a lot of time thinking about the role of soil water on hydrologic response. The middle plot shows that soil water tends to exist in a dry state 
in a wet state with rapid transitions in between, and the state has strong controls on hydrologic response. Next. Uh, we, we do a lot of work on geophysical mapping of the subsurface. This is uh, some ERT images that we use to track the um, evolution of moisture through a year. I think Andy Parsekian and uh, Tesh Cullners are also working on that now on this site. Next. Uh, we think a lot about catchment co-evolution, basically land form, landscape form and hydrologic response uh, going both directions with a particular emphasis on understanding the differences in north-facing and south-facing slopes, both vegetation differences, soil property differences, and hydrologic response in the short term and how hydrologic processes feed back to landscape evolution. Next. And we have done a lot of work on uh, using isotopic signatures uh, to track hydrologic processes. This is largely in collaboration with Dorothy Tetzeloff and the VUA project. Next. Uh, we're currently focused on snow hydrology, uh, a lot of studies looking at the relationship between terrain properties and snow distribution and flow through the snowpack as a runoff generation mechanism. Next. And we are currently a NASA SNOWX site where we're getting, even today, weekly overflights of snow on with extensive field validation so we can uh, understand how improved snow measurements uh, lead to improved hydrologic prediction. Next. We have a, all of our data are turned into educational resources. Next. And it's been a, this probably our most uh, proud outcome is just that we probably had 50 theses done in the watershed and we're uh, populating the agencies with hydrologists. Next. This is a key publication to look at if you're interested, but I'm showing this mostly for the team. These are the primary contributors to the site. Next. But we've recently hired three new professors at Boise State, Kevin Roach in engineering, Anna Bergstrom, who you met, and Chief Ben Yu, also joining the Dry Creek team. Next. And these are the current students working in the site. I think they're in. And that's what I have. Thank you very much, Jim. We don't have any directed questions yet to you, um, but I, I just want to say I really appreciate your highlighting the data sets and their availability. I think that's one of the things that we should really strive to do in this series because it is it, it highlights um, the possibility for collaborative work and synthesis work um, that that audience members as well as panelists might be able to engage in and, and where we're heading for in the, the eighth week of this, this seminar series. Yeah, and I just want to... Well, just want to mention that Jim has some very memorable quotes in that paper he flashed up there toward the end that I put up on the screen at our first meeting, and you'll see again before this series is over. Um, so now we're going to move to Elise Osenga, who's going to move us down to Colorado. Go ahead, Elise. Thanks. I'm actually really excited to follow Jim because I think a lot of the research they're doing is the research we're aspiring to right now in our network. Um, so I'm going to be introducing a network that's in the Western United States that's a relatively newly established network. And I just wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues, Julie Vano and James Arnott, who are also part of this program. Next, please. So I wanted to start by just orienting everyone as to where our watershed is. We are a headwaters for the Colorado River Basin, which serves about 40 million users across the entire basin. Our own watershed, the Roaring Fork watershed, is 3,758 square kilometers and a fairly dry climate. It's a heavily snowpack dominated hydrology, and it's in a region where drought is projected to increase in both severity and duration under pretty much all future climate scenarios. And so it's a really strong concern locally what that's going to mean for our water supplies and for our ecology. And out of that concern has grown the interactive Roaring Fork Observation Network um, that was really inspired by community interest in having science and data to help support their adaptation to future climate scenarios. Today, the network is a series of 10 stations that span our elevational gradient. The earliest station was established in 2012 and the most recent station just came online this past year. Next, please. This is a quick snapshot of what those stations look like on the ground. Our lowest elevation site is in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. That's a scrub oak environment in Glenwood Springs. The highest elevation site is in the lower left of your screen, which is near the Continental Divide on Independence Pass. Next, please. 
The overarching vision for this project is threefold. We're hoping that our data legacy is going to inform land and water management locally and raise local public awareness about climate driven changes. But we're also hoping that it's going to be able to contribute to the broader scientific understanding of mountain systems. Next, please. So in selecting our sites, we really wanted to have a variety of stations that would represent the different elevations and the different ecosystems of the watershed. And we've been fairly successful in achieving that at least. Most of our stations are equipped with basic equipment that measures temperature and relative humidity, um, rain, soil moisture at five, 20 and 50 centimeter depths and soil temperature at 20 centimeter depths. Additionally, some of our sites have um, a satellite instead of a cellularly based logger, snow depth sensors, radiative balance, or wind speed and direction. Our cellular based sites collect data every 20 minutes and our satellite based sites collect data every 60 minutes. In addition to um, those variables, we're also taking vegetation plots periodically at the different sites so we can have a little bit more of the ecology piece of the puzzle. Next slide, please. You have about two and a half minutes. Thanks. Um, so with our relatively new network, we're still discovering what some of the possibilities are for the data applications. Some of the things we're looking at are about what you'd expect, the relationship between final date of snow melt and early season soil drying, things like that. Um, heterogeneous response and soil moisture behavior across different elevations and different soil types. We've also seen some interesting early results in relation to things like intensity of rain events. So for example, a 1.5 centimeter rain event in a single day up here is a lot of rain, um, but that's what it takes to get to some of the deeper soils at most of our sites. Next slide, please. It's important to us that we're not the only ones looking at this data and our data is all publicly available. There are links through our website. We're annually updating data on the Quasi-HIS database and the International Soil Moisture Network database. And we have an API that pulls data from eight of our stations daily. Vegetation surveys are also available on Zenodo. Next, please. It's really important to us that we do make our data widely available because we're hoping to collaborate, um, whether it's globally or locally. Um, we are looking at things like comparing our data to existing networks that might have a longer existing record like the Snowtel or USGS sites. We're hoping to have opportunities to do um, validation of soil moisture data and improvement of modeling. We also are in conversation with a number of basins across the state of Colorado who are interested in adding soil moisture to their parameters they're already looking at. And then finally, at a very, very local level, it's important to us that we integrate stakeholder interests when we're considering our research questions and that we engage the community as much as possible. Next slide, please. The reason we're so very committed to having our community partners engaged at all steps of this process is that this has really been a community-driven network. They've provided funding for the equipment. Um, individuals have come out and contributed time and expertise in their specific fields of work. Um, we've had land use permissions and internships and all kinds of um, contributions from the community that have made this possible in a way it would not otherwise be possible. Next slide, please. So thank you for your time. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me with questions or comments. Thank you, Elise. Um, Rick Webb just posted a question asking if you're involved in the SMAP program, SMAP. Um, no, so the, if anyone is not familiar with it, SMAP is a NASA program of satellite data on soil moisture, and it's something we'd love to be involved with, but are not yet engaged with. Okay. Thank Thanks, Elise. And I just want to take this moment when, when Elise approached me about giving a talk, she had some concerns about, well, you know, our site's kind of new. You sure you want me to, to go up with the Hubbard Brooks and... <laughs> integrated monitoring so I said absolutely this is this whole forum is for people to present their their catchments whether you're starting out whether you've been 50 60 years and we'll all get together at the end and discuss how to move forward okay we're going to move now we're going to stay in Colorado but move across the continental divide to the east side and Jill Barron's going to talk about Lock Vale Thanks very much. Um, it was actually great to hear about the, the Roaring Fork system that's getting going. I've watched it for several years, so I'm happy to see it go. Last week, we heard all about catchment science, and we heard about how, how instrumented catchments are actually used for studying hydrologic processes, and we've heard some of those talks today. Um, 
what I'm going to present today is not a 40 year record of Lockvale watershed, but we did instrument it nearly 40 years ago. Um, and, and it's an instrumented catchment in, but it, but we do all kinds of research there. We don't actually do all catchment science. I'll show you a very little bit of that. What we do instead is use the watershed level information as a foundation in order to ask, or as a backdrop, in order to ask other kinds of process-based questions. And, and by way of saying this, I'm an ecosystem ecologist and, and several of you have, who have already presented are also that way. So hydrology and catchment science are critical foundations for what we ask, but we ask all, all kinds of other types of questions. And I will lead you a little bit through that and end with two recent topics that we're working on right now that I'm excited about. Before we go to the next slide, I just want to show you that I've got a number of co-authors, um, many, many more people who have helped us over all the years since 1983. So next slide, please. We did actually start back in 1983, as Kevin Bishop mentioned, and, and, um, and the Finnish scientists, I'm sorry, I forget your name, looking at, at acid rain. So we got our start at that time. But if you were flying across the continental divide, which is pretty much delineated by these snowpack, snow glaciers, they're actually glaciers. You're looking at the divide, next slide please. And here's Lockvale watershed facing northeast. You're looking south along this photograph. Uh, Lockvale is an alpine and subalpine catchment. The top of it is about 4,000 meters in elevation. The bottom is about 3,100 meters, next slide. Um, we've been doing this long-term research since 1983 when we instrumented both as part of a National Park Service program, and that's morphed into a U.S. Geological Survey program. Next, please. If you look a little bit closer, what you can see are alpine and subalpine ecosystems. This is about a 10 square kilometer catchment, so smaller than some of the ones we've been looking at. We have alpine lakes and subalpine lakes. We have two glaciers, Andrews Glacier and, and an, uh, a rock glacier called Taylor Rock Glacier. Next, please. Um, we have alpine systems, we have old growth spruce fir forests. Next slide, please. And we have very simple instrumentation. Next slide, please. Um, we have a, a meteorological station. Actually, we have three of those spread around the basin. We have a national atmospheric deposition program site where we try to measure precipitation chemistry and precipitation inputs. It's very difficult at high elevation in a lot of windy sites. Next slide, please. We have stream gauge at the lock outlet. We have several other places where we gauge. And we've done a number of experiments and, and um, instrumentations over time in different parts. Next slide, please. We have about two and a half minutes. OK, thank you. Um, we do a number. We have a number of approaches that we do in order to, to ask our questions. We go back in time using paleolimnology. We use experiments to test our, our, our hypotheses. We do ecosystem modeling. We have spatial comparisons with systems all over the world. Next slide, please. Some of the catchment scale biogeochemical modeling we've done over time. Um, our first 10 years, you could see a copy of a book up on the top left. Our first 10 years was spent characterizing this system because in the 80s, very little was known about these systems. But then we've done some modeling with a century model. Next slide, and then next slide with rhesus, with an, and um, our most recent work is with Descent Chem, which is a, a daily version of the century model coupled with a uh, geochemical mass balance model, Freak C. Next slide, please. We've also done some catchment scale hydrology and hydrochemistry. I'm not gonna go into details of these, but you can see some of our collaborators, Stephanie Kampf over time. Um, there's an interesting one in the middle one, if you're with the US Geological Survey, but also Larry Bann and Christina Taig, Glenn Liston, Dave Klaus done a, and his group have done a huge amount of work that I'm not giving credit enough to. Next slide, please. Some of the ecosystem research we've been doing over the years, we've got both terrestrial and aquatic research. And our terrestrial work has been focused on a 20 year forest nitrogen fertilization. We just pulled the plug on it a couple of years ago. We added 25 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, asking what happens ecologically and biogeochemically if you push these systems into saturation. So you see the usual suspects in soil lysimeters. We dropped our pH, we dropped our percent carbon, soil percent carbon. We totally changed our microbial biomass, our microbial communities and our soil food webs. You see an increase in soil calcium. We also see, however, a lot more forest dynamics. Our trees grew better, but only when they were controlled by sufficient soil moisture. 
and our soil, um, soil moisture lysimeters were able to tell us that. What we also found is that the differences attenuated over time and we're going to continue to explore that. So stay tuned on that, please, next slide. A lot of the work we've been doing recently has also been looking at lake trophic state. We have alpine and subalpine lakes. They're beautiful, but over the past 10 years, we've been able to see them proliferate in filamentous algal blooms on the bottom. Next slide. So we went back in time to ask when that started to happen. We used algal pigments, we used stable isotopes of, um, you can go on to the next slide, that's fine. We used stable isotopes of nitrogen and carbon. We also used bulk carbon and nitrogen. And if you look at this trace over time, you can see that we actually went back to about 16 or 1700 with our sediment core. And I'm not gonna dwell on the fact that we see little blips over time with a little ice age, but starting about 1950, you see an increase, a tremendous increase in chlorophyll A, which was dominated by green algae. Next slide, please. We've done a lot of examples over time, and I really like what Kevin said about pivoting our, our focus over time. What we discovered is that nutrients, because nitrogen has been a big focus of what we look at. No, please go back. Uh, nitrogen has been a big focus of what we look at. You see that the nitrogen and phosphorus address really um, allow green algae to dominate. The reverse response is found in diatoms. They don't like the nutrients at all. But if you look at temperature, when we did warming experiments, you see that temperature actually dominates our ecosystem processes. And GPP, gross primary producti productivity, and ecosystem res re respiration, and lake metabolism are dominated by temperature. Next slide. What we're doing most recently, do I need to go on? We're out of time. OK, we're out of time. Thank you. You're muted, Jamie. Any any questions showing up, Steve? No, I think we should move on in the, for the okay. sake of timing. Great. Okay. Next up is Lazo Holko. He'll be telling us about Slovakia in the Tatra Mountains. Go ahead, Lazo. Thank you, Jamie. Good afternoon or good evening to everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our research catchment, which is uh, uh, located in the highest part of the Carpathian Mountains, the second largest and third longest mountain range of Europe. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues and our PhD students. Next slide, please. Uh, the highest part of the Carpathians is a small mountain range called the uh, uh, Tatra Mountains, and our research catchment is located in its western part. Catchment area is about 20 square kilometers. Its mean altitude is 1,500 meters, and about three quarters of the catchment are forested by, by spruce forest and by, by dwarf pine. The overall mission of our research is the improvement of knowledge on hydrological cycling mountains. Next slide. Uh, basic data I coll are collected since the end of uh, 1980s. Our main weather station is, is at catchment mean altitude 1,500 meters. We have other two stations at other altitudes. Catchment runoff is measured at uh, 800 meters above sea level. Next slide, please. In addition to <clears throat> data measured in mountains, we also use data from other two stations located in the foothill part of the catchment. And uh, our uh, research uh, Themes are connected to water balance, snow cover, and runoff formation. We also regularly exchange experience and knowledge with other European colleagues within an, a community called ERB, which is active since 1986. Next slide, please. Uh, mean precipitation, mean annual precipitation in the catchment is 1,500 millimeters. About two thirds of that is runoff. And it's interesting that altitude gradient in precipitation in mountains is not very good even for longer term totals. Um, the site is more important than the altitude of the gauge. Uh, interception is about 30%. And it, it could also be interesting that while we are a generally a wet uh, place, in a dry summer, spruce transpiration can be almost as high as precipitation. Next slide, please. <coughs> about two and a half. Next slide. Yeah, yes. Yes. Our uh, soil uh, snow, snow data show that there is a great variability, but no trends until now, although uh, we have simulated some uh, decrease in uh, snow water equivalent at the lowest altitude in recent years. Next slide. 
Uh, catchment runoff is characterized by, by uh, fast response to rainfall. The lag time, mean lag time is about uh, two hours. We also found threshold effects. And the most significant driver of runoff response is total rainfall. Other indicators like the wetness state are not so important. Next slide. But uh, soils, uh, I th we think, are important because due to their high stoniness, they re decrease water retention. And we found preferential flow for about one half of rainfall events. And macropores uh, contribute by 60 to 100% to water infiltration. We also found similarity between soil outflow and catchment run of hydrographs for about a half of uh, analyzed events. Next slide. Uh, runoff is mostly dominated by the old water. The, the figure here shows uh, the old water contribution to peak flow during several snow melt and run rainfall events. And especially for snow melt events, the few, a, a few first snow melt events are almost completely composed of uh, the old water. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, the overland flow is not very frequent or not dominant as it comes out from our uh, rainfall simulator experiments or soil infiltration capacity and rainfall intensity comparison. Next slide. Because we already ho have more than three decades of data, it has become interesting also to look at the variability and possibly changes and the drivers of these changes. Our research is, is uh, conducted in a, in a clearly warmer period than was climatic standard for the 20th century for our area. Next, next slide. And uh, it seems that the hydrological cycle become more dynamic uh, approximately since 2014, which was, which was um, exhibited in higher runoff uh, coefficients, higher number of flow reversals, flashiness index, etc. Next slide, please. We could also see uh, heavier, uh, isotopically heavier water uh, approximately since 2014. Oops, not yet. Go, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, both in precipitation and catchment runoff. Next one. Next slide, please. And uh, in some winters, uh, we found very, very small or no uh, signature of snow melt uh, in isotopic composition of our stream. Next slide. The, uh, go back, please. <laughs> uh, go back, go back. Oh, the, time, the time is up. Uh, it shouldn't be, it's five minutes. Okay. Okay, so go, uh, well, the indicators of change were all related to, pre, to runoff regime, but there is one more uh, important change in the catchment. Go, go to the last, uh, but one slide, please. Next one. And which is a big uh, uh, change in forest structure, uh, which was natural and which has effects on, on catchment hydrology, which we are going to study. Uh, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, we, we don't have any directed questions at this time. If uh, any of the panelists or anyone can get one in quickly. Um, otherwise, we should probably move on to our last speaker. Okay, thank you, Steve. Our last speaker is Jakob Steiner, and he'll be taking us to the Himalayas. Go ahead, Jakob. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, I'm calling from Kathmandu and I'm saying that because the nature of the place has it that sometimes electricity or internet is going to um, disappear. And that would mean that I'm gone and then you just have to give up on me because I'm not going to come back or it takes too long for that. But I hope I'll be able to use all my six minutes to talk to you about our work in the central Himalaya. I work for EasyMod, which is a research institute that is present in all the countries that are you know, linked to the Hindu Kush Karakoro, um, Hindu Kush Karakoro mountain range. And I'm also a PhD student at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And I'll specifically talk about the Langtang catchment. Um, uh, next, please. That is, uh, you know, in, uh, compared to all the catchments that we have seen, it's, uh, it's, 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 there's very, very little data so far, but compared to the region, this is one of the most comprehensive, um, comprehensively instrumented uh, catchments in terms of the whole water balance in the region. So for those of you who know the region, it's located somewhere between Annapurna and the Everest, just north of Kathmandu in the Ganges Basin. Uh, next, please. So yeah, in this catchment uh, research has started in the, in the 1970s, uh, mainly by Japanese scientists together with the Nepalese partners. Many of them were mountaineers. They came for climbing as well. Um, they did especially research on the cryosphere and with stations that only remained for one season and they left again. 
And then in the in the 90s, uh, the, the local government with Swiss support really started to do some, um, some continuous monitoring, with measuring discharge twice a day and doing rating curves and these kind of things and measuring basic climate. And then since 2012, really in an effort led by ECMOD, uh, together with universities in, in, in Europe and NVE, the Norwegian uh, Energy Ministry, um, and o o o always with the Department of Hydrology and Metrology, uh, a comprehensive network was, was set up over the years, and uh, we, have, uh, we have built that up since then. So there are a couple of full AWS standing in the catchment. Some of them measure snow water equivalent, or most of them measure, or all of them actually measure snow height as well. Uh, we have pluviometers. So we're very interested in the, in the the variability of precipitation in the catchment, and also smaller precipitation sensors. Since uh, so, during my PhD in, in the last two three years, we also installed soil moisture setups. We measure uh, electrical conductivity in, uh, in 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 discharge, and of course, we measure discharge in the catchment as well. So the catchment reaches from about one thousand, just above one thousand meters above sea level, to seven thousand two hundred meters above sea level. So it's quite a, you know quite a wide elevational span and. That makes it quite challenging to characterize uh, the processes that are going on here. And I'm super grateful to this effort that you've been pulling together because this is, an, this is a chance for us to learn from catchments where there has been a lot more experience around already. Um, and also this pushed us for the first time to you know, put all that data together and put it out there for, uh, for availability. So for anyone to use, um, uh, unfortunately, I didn't put the link of the database here, but it will be in. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it is it is available, and I can post it afterwards in the chat. And uh, and uh, th because this is really a, has been an issue in the region, data sharing really has not been as advanced as it has been in the US or in Europe so far. Next, please. You have three minutes. Yep. So I mean, the catchment we have we have three subcatchments where we measure discharge, and 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 what we really look at are different uh, the different glacier covers here. And what is especially interesting in the area is that many of the glaciers are covered in rock, so that's a special a special characteristic. Next, please. But the, most of our focus has been on the weather stations and atmospheric monitoring to get energy balance models running and to understand more about melt from from snow. Uh, melt from the recovered glaciers, refreezing. So we published on that as well, the snow water equivalent and sublimation processes that are very important. Next, please. But there are huge challenges. Um, of course, the cryosphere changes. So basically, we have to reinstall stations constantly, those on the glacier. Um, there are huge avalanches that blow away a lot of the, the blow away setups repeatedly. There was a huge earthquake in 2015 that destroyed a lot of our instruments. And we can only go there twice a year. And uh, it takes quite a lot of time to get some stuff up and running again. And battery quality in Nepal, unfortunately, is really, really bad for the low temperature environment that we work in. Next, please. Um, yeah, there's a big focus on precipitation, so we have uh, we try to get a better understanding of variability in the area. That's why we focus on this. Next, please. But it's also an agricultural area, so there are a lot of yucks around who like to scratch themselves on all kinds of sensors. So that is a challenge, but it's also nice because we actually work in an area where many people live and they live off that area. Next, please. And finally, of course, the most important for hydrology, we measure uh, discharge, but that's quite challenging in these rivers that change their bed continuously. And it's difficult to get the right setup into these locations and developing rating curves. Uh, so enough points on the rating curve for a meaningful and, and you know, a discharge uh, curve that is uh, a discharge time series that, that can be used for models is quite a challenge. And uh, there are many holes in the data, but uh, something that we hope to keep doing in, uh, in, in, the, in the coming years. Next, please. And I think I'll skip that, but these are the rating curves, basically. That's been, that's been a challenge uh, because there are not many points and we, we don't, it's, it's very difficult to access the place, so we don't get to do that very often. Um, and I'll end here. Yeah, that's our toilet. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you, Jakob, and thank you all the, the speakers today. So we're going to move into a, a general discussion right now. So audience members, please keep the, the questions and topics coming in. Most of what has come forth today are questions more about data availability. And I think each of you might be able to speak very broadly. I don't think it's worth pointing out the uh, exact details of how to access it. But keep in mind that, that panelists could enter that information in the chat if they do want to provide direct links or overall links. But um, and, and another point I'll make is that I know that a lot of these sites are or have described their data sets in publications. Um, Elise, for example, has a recent publication in Hydrological Processes 
doing that. Uh, Jill just had a, a paper accepted in that same special issue and others are working through. So there are avenues that will describe that. So feel free to comment broadly or put in exact links in the chat if, if anyone would like. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, Devendra, I think, was broadly asking, Devendra Amatya with the Forest Service in uh, South Carolina was broadly asking about drivers of um, the peak discharge in the year. Um, and I think for most of you, the answer is probably going to be snow melt. Um, but if anybody wants to chime in on that topic as well, please do. This is Jim. We just uh, did an analysis, and it actually is the, it's the timing of snow melt in our site. Uh, more than the magnitude. So our strongest correlation to peak discharge was the, the date of when one inch, that's 2.54 centimeters of SWE was left on the ground. Any other takers on the drivers of peak uh, uh, discharge or the sustained periods of long discharge, of long periods of high discharge for your particular so in, in the Rocky Mountains, at least on the Colorado Front Range in Lock Vale, um, snowmelt is indeed the, the dominant source on a year-to-year -year basis, but we often, not often, but we are more often getting late summer severe thunderstorms that are causing peak discharge, um, tremendous amounts of moisture from cloudbursts that are coming in, um, whether this, I mean, they've, they've probably occurred all over, all um, for many, many decades. But, but it appears now that there's so many more people along the Front Range, they, the flooding that they're causing is, is tremendously dangerous. Anyhow, these, these other events beyond snowmelt are, are occurring with more frequency. And Jill, do you wanna comment on the importance of glaciers and, and how that dynamic is changing with time? Oh, I'm probably not the best person to comment. Our little glaciers are very little. Um, we are seeing ablation of them, but our particular glaciers are what are called um, coal fed glaciers and they they're replenished each year from snow melt or snow that blows in across the divide. So I would defer that to someone who's actually seeing more temperature responses and glacier ablation because of that. So Jill, is melting permafrost a factor in your hydrology? It appears to be a factor in our biogeochemical measurements. Um, but when we calculated it in recent years, Elisa Mass did this with us. Um, she found that it wasn't actually, we don't see an increase in volume in the late summer, but because we're seeing an increase in thawing, especially in the late summer from rock glaciers, um, permafrost and, and, and the glaciers themselves, we're seeing large increases in base cations, in silica and in nutrients. Hmm. So I'll point out that there's quite a discussion going on in the chat. You might want to check up for data links being presented there or some topics are, are being addressed in there as well. Um, let's see. Perhaps, um, you know, Jakob, Dan Moore is having a, a discussion with you on the chat about um, using salt uh, dilution methods to, to mm. check on flow and uh, you know, again, it, you know, it, I'm, I'm handling your paper at HP and I'm just amazed by the amount of effort that you have to put into maintaining the instrumentation. And it, in, in one of the important points of that is that, you know, you're, you're, having, um, you're having so many challenges that you're realizing that gap filling is not a method that you can use. Like you're just losing long periods of data um, so it, any comment on those type of dynamics and how that, it, it, you know, I, it, it's very important to have those continuous records or the, the ongoing records, but clearly in a site like yours, any information is just so valuable. Um, can, can you comment on any of those topics? Uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I mean, I, I agree, any, any information is, is valuable, but I think, and, and, for, and that's what we have been banking on a bit as well, we have been publishing a lot of studies with very limited amounts of, of data, which 
you know, fortunately or unfortunately, it's possible in the Himalaya because there is so little, there is so little around. But I, I see all these catchments that are that are around, and of course we are envious of that. And I think, especially in the Himalayas, as you know, we started in 2012 with something continuous. I would also like to see trends. There is no way we can see any trends, and everyone is talking about climate change in the Himalaya. But we, we see that on large scale data sets from remote sensing, but from catchment studies, we cannot we cannot do any apart from glaciers that recede. That is very clear, and the snow line is going up. That is also very clear. But in terms of hydrology, in terms of soil moisture changes, in terms of you know. Uh, whether there's any isotopic change, uh, did, did, there is there is nothing that we can bank on that we can that we can make a statement about what climate change is actually doing in these catchments, and that's what I'm. I mean, I'm I'm still young enough that perhaps I will experience that we'll we'll have a time series where we can at least make some statement about a trend. So there's a couple comments coming in. Um, one from Jason Leach, just asking Elise in particular to comment on. Um, how exactly are you getting partners, I believe is what the question boils down to. Um, and then I think Jeff has a, Jeff McDonald has a nice related question just on talking about how are all of us sustaining our long-term measurements at sites? So perhaps we'll start with Elise and others can think in the background and, and jump in as she finishes up. Yeah, we're really kind of an unusual network because we've been strongly community supported. So almost all of our instruments have come from local private institutes, counties and cities um, that supported installation. The big challenge for us has been finding um, kind of ongoing funding to just keep maintaining things, which is a little less glamorous than installation. And so some of that's just been internal funds, but we do continue to get support from um, local partners because we're staying in conversation with them. I'll, I'll, this is Jim, I'll follow up, unless, sorry to inter interrupt, and just questions for Elise. So I'm all done. <laughs> Jim, why don't you go ahead? And I think Kevin has a comment after that. So ours, uh, we're pretty much self-funded by individual PI grants. Um, but although we, we do have a permanent technician that maintains it, you know, and once the initial installation happens, which for us was a lot of support through the EPSCOR program initially, but um, I, as many of you know, has been a strong advocate of just share your data freely and widely and use other people's data greedily and acknowledge everyone. And when you do that, people are nice. And um, you know, <laughs> modelers need our data and every once in a while I'll just get, hey, you need a new stream gauge and people buy stuff for me and we should just, just share and be friendly and happy and uh, we'll help each other out. And that's, that's been sustaining our watershed for about 20 years. <laughs> I'd like to say Maybe. that it is being relevant every single year in some way is the way to keep going. Uh, the person who's leading this European initiative for the ELTER, -E which is, will be in place in five years time and will hopefully go for 25 years. He has a lovely picture of somebody walking on a tightrope, but the tightrope ends. <laughs> But I mean, that's sort of the sense of you know, you're walking the tightrope, but there's no future in it. But if you can make things exciting, um, there's a chance that you'll get this long-term data. And then when you've got it, try to make that exciting. That's the, the real discouraging thing as I get older is there's all these evolving data sets and lots of things to dig into. When, who's gonna do it? Um, so good luck, those of you who are younger. Um, <laughs> Maybe I can I can add a few words to, to Jeff McDonald's question. Uh, our secret is that we are a research institute and we have a small permanent staff uh, that works only in the research catchment I presented. And uh, although we always try to start struggle to, to get some equipment, uh, we, we try to, to, to keep saying that the most interesting and the most precious what we have is the catchment and it's necessary to keep it, keep it going on. But basically, we have a small staff which is financed by the government, the salaries and the energy and water. And from time to time, we, we get some money for the equipment. I think um, all of these are great points. And I, yeah. I want to pick up on what Kevin said is if we don't demonstrate what relevance, we're all done. And, mm -hmm. you know, that relevance includes the scientific relevance and how, how we all support each other as well as, you know, our financial supporters or the people who want to apply our research. Um, we're, we're rolling in on the end here. 
Um, Jamie, do you want me to pose another question or do you wanna move on uh, to a wrap up? Yeah, I think we should wrap up. Um, we wanna do wanna keep these to 75 minutes. Um, appreciate everyone's time. We really hit on some of the questions here at the end that you know we really want to explore in our, our last meeting where we have devote the whole session to talking about these issues. How do we sustain funding? How do we keep being relevant? How do we sustain this whole enterprise? And I really appreciate everyone's input, the great participation, and come back next week. We'll keep it running. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.